Okay, so let's expand on that topic of value judgment. Here's a quote uh, from your book in a section that criticizes the lack of imagination in modeling. The quote, the whole concept of predicting the future can sometimes end up reducing the possibility of actively creating a better one. If we want the future to look different than the present and not just a continuation of all of today's trends, then we have to construct models that are able to imagine something more. Can you unpack this, Erica, and why it's important? Yeah, so the example that I was thinking about here is integrated assessment modeling of energy, the energy system and the climate system. And so these kind of models, they they put a price on, you know, nuclear energy, renewable energy, fossil fuels, all the rest of it and and the different sectors in which that energy is used and they and they sort of predict forward by saying we're going to take a least cost pathway. And so you make your assumptions and you put those in and you say, we expect solar energy to decrease in price at the following rate. And we expect fossil fuels to become more expensive because there'll be a carbon tax or something. And you put all of those in and you project it forward and, and it, it tells you what the lowest cost way of meeting your climate targets is uh, with, um, you know, with the assumptions that you've made. And so... Um, I suppose my point is just that these are incredibly boring because they everything is based on continuation of today's trends. Everything is based on pricing. Everything is based on uh, that assumption about what the cost will be. And there, there's, there are choices about what we are going to cost into these models and what we're not going to cost into them. So you can put a price on uh, nuclear energy. You can put a price on um, carbon removal from the atmosphere somewhat speculative but you stick it in and if that price is high if you put it in at sort of five hundred dollars per ton of co2 removed then there won't be very much of it used and if you put it in at two dollars per ton of co2 removed then there'll be vast amounts of it in the model and so your choice of exactly where to put that price point which is an arbitrary expectation of the future uh, that's going to hugely determine what the outcome of the model is and of course, then there are other things which we might consider pricing in, but we don't. So, for example, um, the what it, what would be the cost of behavior change if you were willing to put five hundred million pounds into a behavior change program to reduce energy usage or improve energy efficiency of appliances or something? How much would that? How much would the cost per ton of CO two avoided be? We don't really put that in. If you wanted to consider geoengineering, for example, you know, this is this is I think this is going to be the next big thing that comes into these models will be a cost um, not per ton of CO2, but a per um, sort of per ton of CO2 equivalent by shading the atmosphere with stratospheric aerosols. If we put that in, you know, that would probably be pretty cheap um, relative to the other technologies. And so as soon as you start putting it into the models, I think we will see just in the same way that we've seen models going from high dependence on renewal, renewables to high dependence on carbon dioxide removal, they will go from high dependence on carbon dioxide removal, the next step will be high dependence on solar geoengineering. I think that becomes inevitable. But the question is, are you going to put it in or not? And what price are you going to put on it? And you'll get the answer that you want. If you want, if you want to see a world that has these things, then you put it into your model, and then it goes into the IPCC report, and it goes into summaries for policymakers, and it gets taken seriously in the national media. It becomes part of the national debate. It becomes realised in a way that it wasn't before. So carbon dioxide removal from the atmosphere, 15 years ago, that wasn't really being talked about. And now it is, and it's a major plank of all of the strategies for reaching um, the two degree Paris Agreement target. Um, and so it's there and it has come into the debate through the models and stratospheric aerosol geoengineering, I suspect, is going to do the same thing over the next 10 years. It will it will start by being put into the models, then it will be talked about in the media, you know, then it will sort of become more of a thing and people will talk about it and and then it will start to become policy. I have several follow-up questions to that. 
So there are people out there that say that the predictive natural sciences and models are squeezing out the concurrent imaginative and humanistic accounts of social life and visions of the future, aka climate reductionism. So how do you think that that could be changed or is that a, an important issue? Yeah, I think that's really true. And I think that, you know, this framing of climate as being a technical problem and a sort of model problem that we, we must do all this prediction and we must have these massive computers to predict and then we'll be able to take action to reduce all of the impacts. Um, you know, that it feels, yes, just unhelpfully reductionist that actually this is not it's not just about climate and it's never just been about climate if you could if you could click your fingers and have an infinite source of uh, of clean energy that didn't emit any carbon dioxide you wouldn't actually have solved the problem you'd have created a whole load of other problems um and so i think that's that's the that's the difficulty that we have that that if we are siloed into climate and we say the problem is climate and we have to solve this climate change problem then as you say, we, we squeeze out all of those other questions about what it is to be human and what the future is going to look like and what it ought to look like, what we want it to look like and what society looks like and how we interact with each other and how we relate to the natural world. And all of these questions are just kind of shoved to one side uh, in, the, in the focus on modelling and predicting and the physics and the technology and the science of it. You know, we ignore the fact that actually we are humans and this is a human problem and a human question. And so I would like to see a, um, you know, a working group four in the IPCC, for example, they have three working groups and one is on uh, the physical science, one is on uh, impacts and one is on, um, uh, well, I'm not quite sure exactly what it is, it's sort of technologies for mitigation. Um, but we need a fourth one, right? We need one on uh, values and politics. Why don't we have that? That would be wonderful. I mean, it, it feels so much more important than these other ones, which get so much um, so much traction and so much media coverage. And yet we're not talking about the ways that people think about it and the framings and the, the way that people relate to each other and the, the different value judgments and the different politics that allows somebody who has the same facts available to them and is perfectly intelligent and, you know, has the best interests of the future in mind, somebody like that to come to a completely different conclusion from mine about what the solutions should be and how we should act and what we should do to get there.